Hello Exile and welcome to Noodle's first video in the lore series on Path of Exile. This video covers Act 1. Let's get started. Path of Exile is an action RPG that takes place on the fictional continent of Rayclast. Rayclast has been devastated by a massive apocalyptic event called the Cataclysm that took place 300 years before you start the game. To the southeast of Rayclast is an island called Oriath, which has remained untouched by the Cataclysm. In the beginning of this game, you choose one of seven characters banished or exiled from Oriath. You are sent to Rayclast by ship as punishment for your crimes in Oriath by the High Templar named Dominus. It is currently the year 1599 IC, which stands for Imperialis Conceptus, or Conception of the Empire. The empire conceived was called the Eternal Empire, and its people were called the Eternals. The empire ruled from Rayclast, but it rules no longer. Now the High Templars of Oriath are in power. Written history of Rayclast dates back to 900 BIC, but it is believed that long before then people and gods themselves roamed the world. The High Templars rule Oriath from the capital city of Theopolis, and its people are the Oriath. The continent of Rayclast has many different peoples currently living on it. The Azmiri, the Eternals, the Mariketh, the Ezemites, some Karui captives, and other exiles of Oriath like yourself. The Cataclysm has had many different devastating effects across Rayclast for the past 300 years. On our journey from Oriath to Rayclast, our ship wrecks. We wash up on the coast just south of a small town called Lion Eyes Watch. As we travel around Rayclast, we discover the rich history of civilizations, past and present. And while many terms and people I'm about to name may be unfamiliar, pieces will fall into place as we continue. Lion Eye's Watch is an abandoned Eternal Army stronghold of Marcius Lion Eye, who defended against attacks led by Kaum, leader of the Karui 300 years ago. Marcius Lion Eye was a gemling captain of the Eternal Army, supported by the Emperor Chittus Parandus. A gemling is a person who has been implanted with virtue gems to give them more power. We will learn more about these soon. Kaum's attack was plotted by High Templar Vol, who led the Purity Rebellion, which we will learn more about later as well. I know it's a lot of information. Trust me, we will hear more about this. At the time, the High Templars were a religious order, not rulers. Kaum led his Karui to this south coast on canoes, the same coast we wake up on, to lay siege to Lion Eye's watch. Marcius Lion Eye, so named because he was missing an eye but had it replaced with a golden gem, met the siege with his gemling legion. After some fighting, the Karui turned and fled, and Marcius Lion Eye and his army followed, assuming Kaum had given up. It was known by many, including Marcius, that the Karui only fought with blades in melee combat, as was their tradition. Thus, when Kaum's melee army fled, Marcius believed that was his entire force, as no ranged tactics were used by the Karui traditionally. However, the clever Hiri, Kaum's niece, had noticed this tradition spoke only of men. So, with Kaum's permission, she and all the Karui women trained with Vol's greatest archers. And when Marcius' army gave chase to the Karui led by Kaum, Hiri and her bow women laid waste to them. With that, around 1319 IC, Lion Eye's Watch fell to the Karui. The Karui turned Lion Eye's Watch and its surroundings into the first Karui settlement on Rayclast, as the Karui are native to the island Namakanui. When the Cataclysm began, the Watch was abandoned and eventually taken over by some exiles of Oriath. When our chosen exile wakes up on the beach, we must fight through undead and monsters to find the entrance to Lion Eye's Watch, which is guarded by a very large undead man, the blacksmith Hillock. Hillock was an exile himself, accused of raping and killing many people, including children, back in Oriath. He has been terrorizing the area around Lion Eye's Watch. Once we kill Hillock, we are let into Lion Eye's Watch to meet three other Oriathan exiles, Nessa, Bestel, and Tarkley. Nessa is a kind woman originally from Theopolis who takes care of the exiles in this watch. Bestel, the only survivor of the Marigold shipwreck, is an aspiring poet. And Tarkley is a former pirate and now protector of Lion Eye's watch. Having proven ourselves fit and uncorrupted by slaying Hillock, these exiles ask for some help with simple tasks such as fetching a medicine kit and exploring the carnage around the watch. 
we discover that the cataclysm has not only risen the dead in the area, but also corrupted the wildlife. Quests have us traveling farther north to search for additional supplies or impending threats on Lion Eyes Watch. As we make our way further inland on Rayclast, we learn through carvings what befell Kalm and his Karui that lingered in the area when the cataclysm began, 20 years after the fall of Lion Eyes Watch to the Karui. As mentioned, the Karui's home is Namakanui, which is an island to the south of Rayclast and west of Oriath. The Karui have long been captured and enslaved by Oriathans and Eternals. High Templar Vol asked King Kaum to assist in the Purity Rebellion, and in return the enslaved Karui would be freed. Kaum agreed and successfully overthrew Lion Eye's Watch, as mentioned. Kaum and his remaining warriors slaughtered the local Eternal citizens while creating their settlement. Once the Cataclysm hit, the dead on both sides of that battle rose up and began to attack the remaining Karui near Lion Eye's Watch. The normal practice of the Karui was to bury their dead to honor them, but, quote, The earth of Rayclast rejects the dead. The black spirit of storm and dream now reaches into the ground and raises up our slain imperial foes. It leads the fallen from their graves and drives them to fight us beyond the end, rotted tooth and jagged nail. Our own remembered have joined their cursed ranks. Now Kaum instructed his people to begin burning the bodies that had risen. However, the cataclysm also corrupts the living. The local animals turned into monsters, and from writings we can infer that Kaum himself was driven to madness by the cataclysm. Kaum resumed ancient and abandoned traditions of the Karui, including sacrificing and consuming the flesh of his own people. Kaum's journey from triumph to desperation to madness are written across Act 1 on the weathered carvings. Many of the writings about this time are from Lavianja, Kaum's advisor. Some are from Kaum himself. Kaum claimed he could hear the ancestors call to him, including the Karui god Tukahama. Kaum had dreams that Tukahama left an offering that will save the Karui, so Kaum led his people north, farther inland the continent of Rayclast. Kaum brought his 500 finest warriors all the way to Highgate, into the mines under Mount Veruso, which we will learn more about in Act 4. As we make our way inland up the climb, we run into a Karui woman named Navali. Navali is being held in a cage surrounded by goatmen. When we approach, the goatmen all scatter or get crushed as a much larger goatman named the Fawn appears. When we kill the Fawn, we free Navali, a Karui Hatungo, or wise woman who is actually an undead. However, she seems friendly and competent and tells us that she can see visions of the future. These visions of the future can be purchased from Navali from this point onwards using silver coins. What silver coins represent or where they come from is unknown, but prophecies from Navali are their only use. The Axiom prison sits at the top of the climb, seemingly abandoned. Returning to Lion Eye's Watch, we learn that the Warden Brutus still resides in the prison and has since the Purity Rebellion. Brutus was turned into a monster using thaumaturgical virtue gems. Don't worry, I will explain more about these gems. But fun fact, the gems we use, skill and support gems, are virtue gems. Chevron of Umbra was a gifted thaumaturgist working as a student under Malachi, who we will also discuss more in a later video. Thaumaturgy is defined as miracle working, but in the context of Path of Exile, it refers to the practice of magic, specifically related to magic and experimentation involving these powerful virtue gems. Following the success of Kaum's siege on Lion Eye's Watch, Malachi was concerned the Karui would turn their attentions on the Empire. Chevron was instructed to have Brutus stop the Karui from ever reaching the inland of Rayclast. Brutus, as he aged, had become interested in darker arts to preserve his life and strength. Brutus agreed to keep the Karui from passing, and also agreed to Chevron's thaumaturgy in hopes of becoming a more powerful being. After an agonizing, days-long experiment, Chevron was successful in implanting a thaumaturgical gem into Brutus, but Brutus was too powerful, and killed Chevron and all her aides once he awoke. Any remaining guards fled the prison and locked him inside. It is said Brutus beat his arms to a bloody pulp trying to break free. For 300 years, Brutus has resided in the prison as this thaumaturgical monster. 
As we approach the warden's quarters of the prison, a woman stands above us, looking through Chevron's notebook on thaumaturgy that was left behind. This woman is Piety, who we will come to know quite well in our adventures. She is surprised to see an exile in the prison and leaves quickly. To continue on to Inland Rayclass, we must defeat Brutus. Upon his defeat, we exit the prison into an area called Prisoner's Gate. We follow the road north and find Piety again, standing at the gate. Using her own powers of thaumaturgy, Piety locks the gate and bars access inland. We must find our own way inland, exile. After the Purity Rebellion, Chevron had created this thaumaturgical gate as a second defense against the Karui traveling inland. It seems Piety has thaumaturgical power to rival that of Chevron from 300 years ago. We will learn much more about Piety in future acts, but for now we know Piety as a woman from Oriath who works with a group called the Blackguards. The Blackguards work for the High Templars who currently rule Oriath. We need to find a way past the gate, and as we explore the area we find a path to the ship graveyard, a gloomy coastal landscape. Since Brutus has remained alive, trapped in the prison, we can infer Calm never bothered going through the prison. It seems Kaum and his followers have traveled here as well, as indicated by the weathered carvings, likely taking this path or canoes from the coast to this ship graveyard. We read a carving that tells of how Kaum and his 500 finest warriors continued on, while the remaining Karui of the settlement, led by Kaum's niece Hiri, took canoes back to Namakanui. In this ship graveyard, we run into the ghostly Captain Fairgraves, who is stuck on the coast with his ship until we can retrieve his all flame. Fairgraves warns us of Mervale, a siren who lives in the caverns to the north, and also asks us to retrieve his all flame from the slave girl who stole it. From Bestel, we learn a bit about Fairgraves himself. He was a poet and a famous sailor who worked for High Templar Dominus. Using Karui's slave labor, he traveled around gathering documents about thaumaturgy for Dominus. He had been missing for the last 30 years, apparently stuck right here in the ship graveyard. When we return the Allflame to Fairgraves, he reveals that the Allflame could revive Fairgraves by taking life from others, planning to take our life for his own. Jerk. After a fight, Fairgraves disappears. For now. The caves to the north can take us further inland, but as Fairgraves warned, they are home to Mervale and her daughters. This cave system is called Siren's Cove. Mervale is the final boss of Act 1, and one of the saddest stories we come across. Mervale was a beautiful Oriathan woman who traveled to Rayclass to attend the fights in the Grand Arena of Sarn. She was spotted by the soon-to-be champion and King of Swords, Doresso, as he fought. When Doresso won his title, he shouted out to Mervale to marry him, and she accepted. Doresso's engagement gift to Mervale was the Star of Rayclast, a beautiful but cursed necklace. The Star of Rayclast held a virtue gem that was implanted in the throat of a woman named Kalisa Moss, an opera singer. She became a prolific singer through the power of this gem to a terrifying extent. A Sarn poet named Victorio wrote that, quote, the gem at Kalisa's throat sparkled with starlight brilliance as her C-sharp shattered every pane of glass in the auditorium. Kalisa died at her final opera performance, and her gem was removed and put into the Star of Rayclast. At first, she simply coveted the necklace, wearing it constantly and lashing out at anyone who touched it. You know, clawing out the eye of a girl who touched the Star of Rayclast at a party. Normal behavior. It had given her a beautiful singing voice, but it began to change her. Mervale would sneak out into the night, wandering the streets, coming home cold and covered in seaweed and slime. Her body became covered in odd lumps, her skin was blotchy, her teeth grew long and sharp. Mervale was pregnant at the time with Doresso's child and began to talk excitedly about the children she would have, how they'd be as beautiful as she was becoming. Doresso snuck out in the middle of the night and fled to Sarn to find a cure for this curse. Finding Doresso gone, Mervale ran to the sea and screamed. She waited on the beach for days, eating fish as her transformation continued. He never returned. Transformed into a terrifying tentacled siren, Mervale crawled into nearby caverns and gave birth to her first daughter. 
The cave systems under the continent of Rayclast are immense, spanning from Oriath to Siren's Cove and farther east as we will discover in Act 6. She has remained in these cave systems ever since, still wearing the Star of Rayclast. Using her siren song, she lures sailors to their death, hence the ship graveyard, to feed herself and her daughters. Given the number of Mervale's daughters, it is possible she also mates with the shipwrecked sailors before eating them. She still believes Duressa will return, on one hand cursing him for leaving and not seeing her beauty, on the other pining for him. Upon killing Mervale, we exit the caverns and find ourselves in the southern forest, which is the beginning of Act 2. Welcome back, Exile, to another video in Noodle's complete lore series. This video covers Act 2. Let's get started. When we emerge from the caves of Siren's Cove, we are in the lush southern forest. It's a short trip to the forest encampment located at the southern tip of Lake Constance in the Frisian Forest. This small gathering has four new characters, Groost, Yina, Silk, and Aramir. Groost, Yina, and Silk are all Asmiri, a people from the Asmirian Ranges to the west. Their culture is older than the Empire, and older even than written history. It was the Asmirian Tarkus Veruso who descended from the mountain ranges to found the Eternal Empire in 1 IC. Groost is a warrior for the Asmiri, currently in the forest encampment, who is protective of his people and mistrustful of foreigners. Silk is a hunter, but also a storyteller, which Yina claims have some truth behind their embellishment. Silk and Groost seem to be rivals. Yina is a compassionate woman who can speak to the spirit, which gives her guidance. We learn from Groost that a group of Oriath guards traveled through the encampment and headed east. Aramir is an exile like yourself. He was formerly a scholar in the Great Library of Oriath, and his vast knowledge of Asmiri history has given him acceptance, although tentative for some, into this Asmiri group. Aramir used to work for High Templar Dominus, collecting and translating documents primarily about thaumaturgy from the likes of Fairgraves and Doresso. Aramir claims to regret his work for Dominus, but it has given him much knowledge. Fun fact, Xana calls Aramir uncle, as he also worked alongside Valdo Caesarius, who is Xana's father, and spoilers, the Shaper. We make our way east to follow the Blackguards and find the aptly named Crossroads. We follow the path north to the Chamber of Sins. The ruling emperor during the Purity Rebellion, Chittus Perandus, had this thaumaturgical laboratory known as the Chamber of Sins built for a man named Inquisitor Malagaro. Malagaro, like Chevron, was another student of Malachi in thaumaturgy. Malagaro considered himself an artist, interested in studying the most extreme of human emotions. The Chamber of Sins was built for Malagaro to create more powerful and diverse thaumaturgical tools, more potent than existing virtue gems. In the center of the first floor of the Chamber of Sins is the Reverie device, which many players will recognize as a map device. There is a note on the device from Malachi to Inquisitor Malagaro, telling him he must mentally prepare for his experimental transformation of virtue gems and to master conscious dreaming, which is a cryptic hint to the use of the reverie device. We make our way downstairs and enter a long chamber where we see Piety running away, towards us but on the other side of a large chasm, and she escapes. Piety challenges us to find her in the city of Sarn as she leaves. Just ahead, a woman is hiding and warns us of a thing that has slaughtered everyone. Here we encounter the monstrously deformed Spider-Man named Fidelitas the Morning. Please forgive my pronunciation of this name. I have no idea how to pronounce it correctly. Fidelitas was once Malagaro's assistant, a man named Rallo. Raulo was highly devoted to Malagaro and his work, and some believe Raulo was in love with Malagaro. Raulo allegedly offered himself as a test subject for Malagaro's thaumaturgical experiments. Malagaro took advantage of this devotion and injected Raulo with Calibric Extantia, which is the essence of a virtue gem. And Raulo became this monster, which Malagaro named Fidelitas 
after fidelity or loyalty. Fidelitas has been here since before the Purity Rebellion began in 1319 IC. After killing him, the woman steps out of hiding and introduces herself as Helena. Helena was a blackguard working for piety. Piety had come to the Chamber of Sins, seeking one of Inquisitor Malagaro's creations called the Baleful Gem, which we have picked up after defeating Fidelitas. Apparently, Piety was not aware of Fidelitas' presence, and the entire Blackguard group besides Piety and Helena were killed. Piety deserted Helena and escaped, as we saw, and now Helena swears to help us track down and stop Piety. The Baleful Gem is one of Malagara's experiments on enhancing virtue gems. Apparently, the experiment itself was a failure, but Helena tells us that the Baleful Gem and Venom from one of Malagaro's arachnids can create a powerful poison called the Black Elixir. Inquisitor Malagaro has made the Black Elixir before, claiming it as the most potent poison in existence. Helena returns with us to the forest encampment and tells us what Piety's plans were in this area. Besides the Baleful Gem, Piety was looking for the instrument for injecting Calibric Extantia, or Essence of Virtue Gem, which is referred to as Malagaro's Spike. Helena's arrival stirs mixed feelings in the forest encampment. Most are distrustful. But we have proven our power by defeating Fidelitas, so the members of the encampment ask us to help with other quests in exchange for helping us find Piety. Yina has already asked us to kill a large bear called the Great White Beast. If you have, she will ask you to go to the Felshrine Ruins and retrieve the good man's hand. Aramir asks us to handle three bandits that live in camps across the Frisian Forest, who are fighting for control over the area. Apparently, each bandit took a piece of a small pyramid that the encampment held, an artifact that granted enhanced strength. If we collect the three pieces, we can make the small pyramid whole and grant some peace to the encampment. We learn that the overly large beasts in the area are all experiments of Malagaro, including the great white beast and a large spider to the west named the Weaver. Silk tells us that he had Malagaro's spike, not knowing its history, and that it was his favorite weapon, but he lost it trying to fight the Weaver. To the south of the crossroads are the Fell Shrine ruins. The Felshrine ruins were once the Frisia Cathedral, presided over by Archbishop Joffrey. Joffrey was a Templar and starkly anti-thaumaturgy. He was horrified that Emperor Chittis had allowed Malagara's laboratory, a place for extreme thaumaturgical experiments on beasts and people alike, to be built so close to his cathedral. In part due to this disgust, Archbishop Joffrey plotted with the leader of the Purity Rebellion, High Templar Vol, to kill Malagaro and destroy the laboratory that Joffrey himself dubbed the Chamber of Sins. Malagaro learned of this plan. When Joffrey sent men to attack the laboratory, they were killed, and Malagaro sent his own men to kill Joffrey in his cathedral and succeeded. Archbishop Joffrey's spirit was brought back to life by the cataclysm and remains in the ruins of the cathedral to this day, at the Golden Hand Shrine where he was killed. You can kill Joffrey to safely get the hand, or avoid his attacks and take the hand, leaving his spirit there. The three bandits vying for power over the Frisian forest are Creighton, Oak, and Alira. All three are Oriath exiles. The three were assisting a woman named Lily Roth, who we will meet later, in retrieving an artifact called the Teardrop from the Templars in Theopolis. The three bandits reside in different areas of the forest, and you can either help one bandit and receive their reward, or kill all the bandits and receive Aramir's reward. With either choice, we can collect the three parts to complete the small pyramid called the Apex that was stolen from the Asmiri. Creighton lives east of the crossroads on the Broken Bridge. Oak is northwest of the encampment in the wetlands. Alira is in the western forest. In this western forest, we also see the other side of the gate Piety sealed in Act 1. We can kill her lover, Captain Artiri, to unlock this gate. The small pyramid is an ancient artifact that has resided with these Asmiri descendants for some time. But the Asmiri are not known for pyramids. There is an ancient civilization come and gone that lived alongside the Asmiri that are known for pyramids, a civilization we will learn much about called the Val. 
In the western forest, we find groups of trees covered in spider webs indicating the entrance to the weaver's chambers, where Malagaro's spike was dropped. We must fight our way through a maze of spiders to find and kill the weaver, a large spider that was once Malagaro's experiment. We know that Malagaro's spike was used as a tool to inject calibric extantia, but we can also use it to contain venom from the weaver, which combined with the baleful gem makes the powerful poison black elixir. Up in the wetlands, there is an old tunnel covered by the roots of the great tree Lorata. Aramir says this is the oldest tree in this part of the continent, which means it must die. We learn that this entrance is likely to an old Val ruin. Helena tells us that Piety, along with studying the works of Malachi's students, is greatly interested in the Val. Piety, Helena, and the Blackguards had tried to enter this area beneath Lorata's roots to no avail. With the Black Elixir, we are able to poison the roots of this great tree and enter the Val Ruins. The Val Ruins are filled with sarcophagi, and Aramir refers to the place as a tomb. The Val civilization lasted from at least 900 BIC, the recorded first contact with the Asmiri people, until the fall of the Val in 400 BIC. Piety is interested in the Val because the Val were a people who used thaumaturgy and virtue gems, which they called Tears of Magi. Pardon pronunciation again. The Val were the first to create and use virtue gems that we know of. Fun fact, the difference between regular skill gems and Val skill gems is the need for sacrifice, killing enemies and harvesting their souls, to utilize a Val gem. While we eventually learn a lot about Val culture and its various traces found in modern ray class, the significance of these particular ruins are a mystery. As we make our way through the maze-like ruins, we must break an ancient seal that blocks our path forward. Once we release the seal, the entire forest is blanketed in darkness. By releasing the seal, we have awakened something. When Tarkas Veruso founded the Empire, he intentionally did so on the ruins of the Val, saying, the Val closed their eyes to flesh and stone, to blood and bronze. We are not Val. We are Asmiri. For now and forever our eyes are open. It is written by Trinian, historian of the Val and Eternal Empire and Intellectus Prime during the Cataclysm 300 years ago, that in 5 IC, shortly after the Eternal Empire was founded, a darkness overtook the lands around Sarn. Some believed it to be a strange weather pattern described as perpetual night. Emperor Caspiro, the second emperor, was found dismembered by something referred to as a dark being, only five years after he began his reign. In 35 IC, General Alano Frisia led a group into the lair of this beast, in the former realm of the Val, and sealed it away for eternity, wink, ending the perpetual night. It is likely that the seal we release that causes the darkness is this same seal from General Frisia in 35 IC. It's also possible this forest was named after Frisia for his heroism in sealing this dark being. So good job us for undoing that. We continue past the broken seal through the northern forest to the caverns, which sprawl underground, and eventually dump out into the base of a large Val pyramid. We ascend the levels of the pyramid, ending up in the apex where a dark altar sits. The altar is missing the very top of its pyramid, which is the same size as our small pyramid we restored from the bandits. Placing our pyramid onto the altar, a rumbling begins, and a large being called the Val Oversoul looms before us. The altar itself seems to be the body of this strange mechanical beast, this dark being is what killed Emperor Caspiro. Rather than sealing the dark being away once more, we fight it. Upon defeating the Val Oversoul, a feat no one before us could accomplish, the darkness dissipates. Another rumbling is heard, and a passage opens up from the top of the pyramid, leading us to the outskirts of Sarn. Welcome back, Exile, to another video in Noodle's complete lore series, this video is covering Act 3, and it is a doozy, so buckle up and let's get started. When we emerge from the Val Pyramid of Act 2, we find ourselves in the outskirts of the city of Sarn. 
We follow the Chittis River up north, getting closer to the city's center. On our way, we run into a woman being held hostage by Piety's blackguards. This is Clarissa, an exile of Oriath. When we defeat the blackguards surrounding her, Clarissa tells us that she and her boyfriend Tolman were found by Piety herself, and Piety has taken Tolman. She asks us to find Tolman for her and agrees to meet us at the encampment by the Grand Arena of Sarn. Sarn is the first city founded in the Eternal Empire by the Asmiri Tarkis Veruso, established in 1 IC. Veruso came down from the Asmirian mountain ranges through the Doomlands to Azala Val, where Queen Atziri reigned until the fall of the Val. Sarn is built on these Val ruins. We saw other ruins of the Val in Act 2 as the Val were a powerful, sprawling culture from 900 to 400 BIC. Veruso sealed off everything Val, including the pyramid we escaped from, and banned thaumaturgy and those who meddled with it. The city of Sarn was the seat of the Empire until the Purity Rebellion of 1333 IC. Sarn is where the final battle of the Purity Rebellion took place in 1334 IC, with High Templar Vol leading his many armies against Sarn and the reigning Emperor Chittis Parandus. Vol gathered support from the Karui, led by Kaum, as well as the Ezemites and the Mariketh. Vol even sowed distrust of Emperor Chittis amongst the common people of the Empire and those concerned with the use of virtue gems and thaumaturgy that Chittis coveted. Now that the High Templars are in power and the Cataclysm has wrecked Rayclast, they rule from Oriath. The Sarn encampment is built near the ruins of the Grand Arena of Sarn, which stands in the middle of Sarn surrounded by the waters of the Chittis River. Within Sarn, there are two temples, one for the sun god Solaris and one for the moon god Lunaris. There is an expansive marketplace, a library, and a cathedral built by Emperor Chittis. Clarissa is at the Sarn encampment along with Hargan, Maramoa, and Grigor. We learn that Clarissa was once into thaumaturgy herself, and has known Piety since before she took the name Piety. Piety, when she was known as Vinya, used to purchase ingredients for thaumaturgy from Clarissa back in Theopolis. Clarissa was exiled to Rayclast because her father gambled away their money and the family had to do illegal work to keep fed. In fact, Hargan helped procure Clarissa and her family this work back in Theopolis. Hargan is an Oriath who seems knowledgeable of black market dealings and the underground, past and present. He's quite jovial, but the others warn you he does not give anything without expecting something in return. Maramoa is a Karui, but was exiled from Oriath as well. Maramoa is a warrior, but she is also extremely knowledgeable about history. Grigor is an Ezemite man who is horribly disfigured from the thaumaturgical experiments Piety practiced on him. He was caught by General Gravisius, one of Piety's blackguards, while trying to find the remains of the fabled Gemling Queen in the Solaris Temple. Gravisius gave Grigor to Piety as his punishment. Clarissa knows General Gravisius as well, from back on Oriath, where he was working for the current ruler, High Templar Dominus. Both Piety and Gravisius are now on Rayclast. Knowing that Piety has Tolman, we exit the Sarn encampment into the slums to find them. We wander past a locked entrance to the sewers and eventually find the crematorium. The crematorium itself is pretty self-explanatory, although it seems to have prison cells as well. When we enter, we can hear screams, which we can presume are Tolman. We find Piety and her black guards around a chair which Tolman has been strapped to. We attack Piety, but at the last minute she escapes once again. Tolman has unfortunately passed, and we retrieve his bracelet to return to Clarissa as proof we had found him. We return Tolman's bracelet, and Clarissa gives us keys to the sewer we passed earlier, which can be navigated to get deeper into the city and hopefully find Piety. Hargan tells us if we're going through the sewers to watch out for three platinum busts that a man named Victario, the people's poet, had stolen from Emperor Chittis during the Purity Rebellion and smuggled into the sewers. Fun fact, one of the busts is of Marcius Lionai, the gemling captain defeated by Kaum at Lionai's watch. Victario was a popular poet around the time of the Purity Rebellion, who wrote in support of High Templar Vol and the people. He wrote his observations on the power and destruction of the virtue gems that Emperor Chittis so valued. Another fun fact, one of his writings is about Kalisa, the opera singer whose virtue gem became the star of Rayclass that transformed Mervale. 
Victoria's writings stirred unease in the people about Emperor Chittis and Thaumaturgy, which helped Vol and his Purity Rebellion gain support. Victorio dubbed Emperor Chittis the Monkey King, and we can find graffiti all around Sarn condemning the Monkey King, his gemlings, and his shadow. Victorio was also known for being a thief. So many fun facts. Victorio is the one who stole Malagaro's initial black elixir, created from Malagaro's spike and the baleful gem, that we recreate to kill the tree Lorata and enter the Val ruins. Victorio had operated in these sewers to help the rebellion and spread dissent. In the sewers, we pass a monstrous puckered barricade called the Undying Blockage, which blocks the path to another area of Sarn. For now, we continue to our only exit, which leads us to the Parandus Marketplace. The Marketplace is a sprawling, open-aired location overrun by the Undying, or Undead Gemlings, and living statues. When Emperor Chittis Parandus ruled, he was obsessed with thaumaturgy. Many of the nobility of Sarn and the Empire were interested in having virtue gems embedded in their skin or implanted surgically like Brutus. These people were called gemlings, and both the Empire's army and its civilians took place in this type of thaumaturgy. A material called thaumatic sulfite was leftover material from refining virtue gems and was used in multiple ways, including as a softening agent for the statues seen in Sarn. When the cataclysm struck, gemling people transformed into these undying, and these statues formed with thaumatic sulfite came to life. Clearly, the link between the cataclysm and thaumaturgy is strong. The marketplace itself is as old as the city of Sarn and the Empire. While the marketplace isn't officially named the Parandus Marketplace, it was founded by the Parandus family and made the family incredibly wealthy. The Parandus family were influential figures in the Empire even before Chittis Parandus became Emperor in 1319 IC. We travel through this marketplace to an area called the Battlefront, in the northeast part of Sarn. The Battlefront connects to the Solaris Temple, the docks, and a bridge to the Ebony Barracks, which has been magically blockaded by the Blackguards. The bridge is guarded by Captain Aurelianus. We kill Aurelianus and take a treasure he was protecting, a ribbon spool, of mysterious origin. While many seasoned players will skip straight to the docks at this point, it makes more sense lore-wise to continue on to the Solaris Temple. The Solaris Temple is one of two temples in Sarn which give worship to the gods Solaris and Lunaris, the sun and the moon. Grigor tells us that the Eternals revered sun and moon as the two eyes of their god, the right eye judging Solaris, the left eye merciful Lunaris. We know that Grigor was caught and experimented on by Piety for trying to find the remains of a person called the Gemling Queen in the Solaris Temple. We search the temple and end up finding more than just remains of the Gemling Queen. She is still alive. This Gemling Queen is a woman named Diala. We can clearly see multiple virtue gems protruding from her head and shoulders. Lady Diala has an interesting way of speaking that is poetic and rambling but her history is absolutely fascinating. Whether her odd behavior is the result of the cataclysm giving her madness, how she's always been, or simply eccentricities from surviving alone for 300 years is hard to say. Lady Diala was one of Emperor Chittis Parandus's mistresses. Apparently, if Chittis got annoyed or tired of a mistress, he would hand that mistress over to his thaumaturgists. Diala was given to Malachi when she lost favor. Malachi, the teacher of both Chevron and Malagaro, embedded the virtue gems into Diala and she became the Gemling Queen. Diala loved Malachi and was willing to do as he asked. Diala tells us that Malachi was massively influential in Chittis Parandus' interest in virtue gems. In Victorio's poems about the monkey king Chittis, the shadow of the king is referring to Malachi. Maybe not so fun fact, during the Purity Rebellion, Diala killed the poet Victorio's lover, Marilyn, as punishment for his writings against the Empire. Malachi told Chittis that these virtue gems could make citizens of the Eternal Empire more eternal. It was with Chittis' approval that Malachi was able to enlist students of thaumaturgy and have many thaumaturgical experiments take place across Rayclast. It is shocking that Diala survived not only the Purity Rebellion, but the Cataclysm without turning into an Undying. We find out that Malachi also survived the Purity Rebellion. 
even though he had been working so closely with the defeated Emperor Chittis. Apparently, Malachi convinced High Templar Vol, leader of the Purity Rebellion, that he could create a device to put an end to all thaumaturgy. Malachi, through his and his students' studies, had discovered the source of thaumaturgy, an entity which Malachi called the Beast. For over a year, Malachi and Diala stayed in this Solaris temple, working on Malachi's invention called the Rapture Device. She tells us that Malachi convinced Vol that the device needed to be taken up north to cleanse Rayclast of thaumaturgy forever. Malachi, Diala, and Vol all traveled to this location with Malachi's rapture device, where Malachi asked Diala to sacrifice herself to complete the rapture. Diala refused, and somehow Malachi's use of the rapture device has caused the cataclysm that has devastated Rayclast. You will learn more details of Malachi and his rapture device in Act 4, but for now we know Diala the Gemling Queen has survived by hiding out in the Solaris Temple. The ribbon spool we found in the battlefront is her device, used to make the living ribbons we have seen floating around and attacking us. Diala refers to us as not a cockroach because she considers these blackguards to be cockroaches who feed on the corpse of a dead empire. Because we return this dangerous spool to Diala, she tells us that we can destroy the undying blockage in the sewers with thaumatic sulfite if we can bring it to her. The same leftover material from refining virtue gems that animates the sculptures of Sarn. Malachi had shipments of thematic sulfite come in via the docks. On the docks, we can find the thematic sulfite in question, but we also run into a familiar face, Captain Fairgraves. It turns out that Allflame didn't fully work when he tried to kill you in Act 1, and he now exists somewhere between human and ghost, still chained to his ship. He would like you to help him die, because once dead, the Allflame will resurrect him again, hopefully correctly. Fairgraves wants you to collect the Decanter Spiritus and the Chittus Plum for his quest. The Decanter Spiritus is an invention by none other than Malachi. It is a vessel that can turn any liquid quasi-apparitional in nature, as Fairgraves describes. Apparently, Malachi was interested in something called ghost wine, or at least turning regular liquids into something corporeal. The Chittis plum grows from a tree planted over Emperor Chittis' body. We learn through this quest that on the day Vol and his supporters marched on Sarn, Emperor Chittis was stabbed by Lord Ondar, mayor of Sarn. Emperor Chittis was a gemling himself, with a gem implanted above his heart. Book 5 of the Purity Chronicles says that Chittis, empowered with rage and strength from his virtue gem, sliced Ondar in half before he died. The Chittis plums are said to cause great agony and possibly death on consumption. When Fairgraves mixes the Chittis plums juice into the Decanter Spiritus, he is able to drink it. But for some reason, the Allflame has gone out, and we can assume that Fairgraves will not be resurrected after this final, agonizing death. We bring Diala the Thaumatic Sulfite from the docks, and she creates Infernal Talc, which is a substance that can destroy the Undying Blockage. Diala knows that the sewer route will lead us to the Ebony Barracks, which the Blackguards have been barricading. Art fact! Diala knows about the sewer systems because she was given to Malachi when she asked Emperor Chittis where the town's poop went. Seriously. We head back to the Grand Arena. Gregor urges us to find and kill Piety as revenge for Piety deforming and torturing him. We know from Diala and Maramoa that the Blackguards and Piety have been seen with General Gravisius. Gravisius is the current High Templar Dominus's right-hand man. Everyone would like to see General Gravisius dead as well. Gravisius and Piety are working for Dominus on Rayclast, for reasons still unknown, but we now learn that Dominus himself is also on Rayclast, instead of in Oriath. Dominus has set up a thaumaturgical laboratory of his own at the top of the Scepter of God, formerly known as the Chittis Cathedral. Rigor tells us that Dominus gets up and down this tower via elevator, afraid of the monsters inside it, but that the tower itself has been locked. Of course, there is the Eternal Labyrinth here and the lore of Ascension, how Chittis Parandus came to power. Um, unfortunately, Act 3 is already jam-packed. There's no way we can squash all of that information into any of the Act videos, so I will be doing a separate video about the lab. 
We used the infernal talc to destroy the undying blockage in the sewers and emerge in the ebony barracks on the northwest side of Sarn. Farther west is the Lunaris Temple, where we believe piety is hiding. We see more blackguards here and run into General Gravisius. Gravisius says some not-so-nice things to us, so it's a pleasure to kill him on everyone's behalf. Unlike the Solaris Temple, which seemed relatively untouched, the Lunaris Temple has been desecrated by the likes of Piety and other Thaumaturgists. The first level has blackguards in it, but also necromancers and the evidence of thaumaturgical experiments. One such experiment is Cole, who is reminiscent of Brutus from Act 1. Cole was Grigor's bunkmate when captured by Gravisius, a rapist from Oriath exiled as punishment. Cole was also one of Piety's experiments, like Grigor, and his similar build to Brutus suggests Piety may have learned something from her studies of Chevron's texts back in the prison in Act 1. As we descend to the second level, the evidence of Piety's thaumaturgy becomes grotesque. The temple is a horror scene. Everything is covered in blood, literal pools of blood taking up the majority of the floor. Poor, failed experiments are impaled on spears amidst the blood pools. Corpses begin piling up on the floor as we make our way through this maze, following the ever-growing carnage leading to piety. Finally, we see her, follow her to the final room, and begin to fight. But who is piety, really? We have chased her around Ray class, trying to stop the havoc she's been causing. Piety was once named Vinia, and was a prostitute and thaumaturgist in Oriath. We know she used to purchase ingredients for her thaumaturgy from Clarissa. Since the short reign of High Templar Vol, after the success of the Purity Rebellion, thaumaturgy has been outlawed in Oriath. The Purity Rebellion was an attempt to fight the monstrosities the Empire's interest in thaumaturgy had created and to purify Rayclast and Oriath. The ruling High Templars since the Rebellion have also stood against thaumaturgy, and Vinya was condemned to death for her crimes. Vinya was brought before High Templar Dominus, and they shared a dinner so Dominus could hear her confession. After this dinner and discussion, Vinya was not killed. Dominus renamed her Piety and became heavily interested in thaumaturgy himself. We ourselves have seen the power of thaumaturgy in the enemies we fight and the virtue gems we use to kill them. The power of thaumaturgy and its potential uses is highly persuasive. Piety has been ordered to gather all the information about thaumaturgy she can from Rayclast and bring that information to Dominus. It was only after Vinya became Piety and inspired Dominus's interest in thaumaturgy that Oriath criminals began being exiled to Rayclast rather than killed. We can speculate this was so Piety had people to experiment on away from Oriath to keep her experiments secret. Judging from the carnage in the Lunaris Temple, Piety has been doing a lot of experimenting. Piety has been learning all she can in particular about Malachi and his works, hence her studies of Chevron, her interest in Malagaro's equipment, and her attempts to find the Gemling Queen in the Solaris Temple. We can now make our way towards the Scepter of God, where Dominus himself likely resides. We now know that Dominus is behind all of Piety's undertakings. The Imperial Gardens lead to the Scepter of God, but also the Sarn Library. The Sarn Library itself is pretty self-explanatory. Inside, however, is a ghost named Siosa, who is attached to a painting of himself. Siosa was a Karui slave who became a scholar and survived the Cataclysm by having his spirit bound to this painting. He asks us to find four pages written by Isius Perandus, who was translating Val texts in the library when Siosa was alive. These pages are in the archives, which Siosa cannot reach because he is stuck to a painting. We find the hidden entrance to the archives, begin gathering these golden pages, and find something interesting. The first three pages are written by Isseus, translating Val texts regarding their interests in thaumaturgy and their communion with something called Nightmare. The fourth page is a direct note to Siosa complimenting Siosa's humanity and saying that his slavery will cause them to overlook you a rather cryptic message. At the end of the fourth page, Siosa tells us that there is a note from Malachi to Isseus, which reads, My dearest Isseus, I have been enlightened beyond expectation. Your work in translating these artifacts is worthy of the highest recompense, and thus I am delighted to offer you a position in my personal laboratory. Please do not give your escorts any consternation. 
I would be most pained to see such a precious asset damaged in any way. Malachi. Malachi kidnapped Isseus to use him and his knowledge for his work. From what we've seen happen in the laboratories of other thaumaturgists, we can imagine that Isseus did not meet a pleasant end. While Siosa was overlooked, for his work in the library because of his background as a Karui slave. Fun fact, the scholar Trinian, the intellectus prime who wrote of the Val and founding of the Empire, is an undying stuck in these archives. We leave Siosa and the library to head to our final destination in Act 3, the Scepter of God. But what is the Scepter of God? It used to be the Chittis Cathedral before the Purity Rebellion. It is actually the site on which Emperor Chittis Parandus was betrayed and murdered by Lord Mayor Ondar. The fact that High Templar Dominus has taken over a cathedral once dedicated to the emperor most embedded in thaumaturgy is no coincidence. Neither Piety nor Dominus actually enter the Scepter of God themselves, but we must enter and fight our way up the tower. The Scepter of God is overrun by gemling creations and creatures. Finally, we get to the top floor, and take some stairs to the roof where Dominus waits. Dominus is the current High Templar ruling Oriath, but he is also the person responsible for our exile from Oriath. And now we know why. Beyond our crimes, Dominus has been using exiles as fodder for his and Piety's thaumaturgical experiments. The roof has been transformed into a thaumaturgical laboratory like those we have seen before. Dominus and Piety are convinced that the use of thaumaturgy can bring them closer to God and the betterment of mankind overall. By experimenting on the bad exiles, they could give knowledge back to Oriath. This is why Vidya was spared and became Piety, for giving Dominus the vision of leadership through thaumaturgy. Dominus still sees himself as a man of religion, utilizing the tools of thaumaturgy rather than scorning them. Dominus begins the fight relatively normally, using powerful magics to attack us. He screams at us about the power of God, such as SHRINK NOT FROM GOD, or THE TOUCH OF GOD. When it seems we've killed him, he shouts, THIS WORLD IS AN ILLUSION, and resurrects in a monstrous form, a giant bug writhing from the ground with the same mask Dominus had been wearing. Here we witness the true face of thaumaturgy, I mean God. On killing High Templar Dominus, Diala appears to congratulate us for embracing death and generously sharing it with those that stood in our way. She opens the door to the aqueduct, a channel built to move water, and we follow this aqueduct's path to begin Act 4. Hello again, Exile. Welcome to another video in Noodle's complete lore series. This video covers Act 4, so let's begin. After defeating High Templar Dominus on the roof of the Scepter of God, we leave Sarn via the aqueducts to the north. We end up in Highgate, which was a mining town during the Empire's existence. It sits at the base of the Esmeri mountain ranges, in particular Mount Veruso. From the beginning of the Eternal Empire, the first Emperor Veruso has used mines in these mountains to seal away the virtue gems of the Val that had been left around Rayclass after the fall of the Val in 400 BIC. During Emperor Chittis Parandus's reign, starting in 1319 IC, the Eternal Empire used its Karui, Ezemite, and Mariketh slaves to mine the mountains near Highgate for these virtue gems. Highgate is inhabited by the Mariketh. The Mariketh are a matriarchal society native to the Vestiri Plains to the east. During the Purity Rebellion, High Templar Vol entreated the Mariketh to join the rebellion to fight the slavery of the Eternal Empire and to take down a man named General Titusius, who worked for Emperor Chittis specifically to hold the Vestiri Plains from the conquered Mariketh. Titusius was known as the Scourge of the Mariketh. The Mariketh's leader at that time was Sekuma Deshret, and we will discuss Titusius and Deshret in detail later. But after the success of Vol's Purity Rebellion, Deshret and her Akara, which means tribe, stayed in Highgate specifically to guard these mined mountains. Deshret sealed off the mines so that nothing could enter or escape them. The NPCs of Highgate are Oyun, Kira, and Tasuni, all Mariketh, and a couple named Pitaris and Vanya. Diala, the Gemling Queen, has joined us from Sarn. 
Oyun is the current Sekima, or leader, of the Mariketh. Kira is a descendant of Deshret, and a Dakara, meaning warrior, of the tribe. Tasuni is her brother, a blind man who suffers from strange visions. Tasuni was born blind, and it is Mariketh tradition to discard any weak or disfigured children, much like Spartans. He was left out in the Vestiri Plains after his birth to die, but somehow survived, which had never previously happened. Thus, he is allowed to live with the tribe. Tasuni seems to have communion with the beast, or nightmare, that Malachi sought, and that the Val had written about. Pataras was a captain of the Blackguards under Dominus and Piety. Vanya was a witch exiled from Oriath, imprisoned and soon to be experimented on by Piety. Pataras let Vanya free, and they escaped together to Highgate. Diala tells us that Malachi's rapture device, the device High Templar Vol allowed Malachi to create to destroy Thaumaturgy, is within the sealed mines under Mount Veruso. Vol, Malachi, and Diala all traveled to Highgate with the rapture device and took it down into the mines to use on this entity called the Beast, which Malachi claimed was the source of all thaumaturgy. Malachi entered the lair of the Beast by himself, and his communion with the Beast and its powers of nightmare was the cause of the Cataclysm in 1336 IC. As we've seen, the Cataclysm killed many, caused others to go mad, and reanimated the dead. Vol was no exception, and he turned into a bloodthirsty, monstrous version of himself. Oyun tells us that he still wanders around the Dried Lake off of Highgate. The Dried Lake was once a large, natural lake, but it has been siphoned out to the city of Sarn via the aqueducts we traveled along. The undead Vol has been terrorizing the Mariketh in Highgate since the Cataclysm from his new home in this Dried Lake. Vol stands by his confession. I vowed to care for this empire with my eyes open. I lied to my people. I lied to myself. Blinded by my lust for purity, I placed my faith in the most corrupt of men. I have failed you, my empire of purity. Do not forgive me, but please, I beg of you, survive me. Vol was the leader of the Purity Rebellion before the Cataclysm, but before he became the Emperor after this Purity Rebellion, he was the High Templar. The High Templars are a religious order of Oriath. The Empire, when founded by Tarkas Veruso, believed in banning and burying all thaumaturgy, past or present, but Emperor Chittis Parandus was heavily invested in thaumaturgy. The High Templars believe in purity, and Vol in particular believed that purity was the opposite of the thaumaturgy rampant under the reign of Emperor Chittis. In his time, High Templar Vol was seen as a champion of freedom and justice. He was a hero to the common folk and those oppressed by the Empire. His reasons for the Purity Rebellion were noble. To save humanity from unchecked power, political or thaumaturgical. The Mariketh had been terrorized by a gemling general named Hector Titusius. Titusius' duty was to control the Vastiri Plains, the native land of the Mariketh, and keep it secured for the Empire. Titusius was a virtue gem enthusiast, allowing Malachi to replace every joint in his body with implanted virtue gems. He was particularly violent towards the Mariketh, and so Vol promised to help the Mariketh, led by Sekima Deshret, take down Titusius. Vol and his operatives discovered Imperial spies within the Mariketh and gave them false information about a Mariketh uprising, knowing the info would get back to Titusius. Titusius led his legion to the false location where Deshret and her Akara were waiting. The Mariketh were able to track the dust storms of the Vastiri Plain, and they planned a day in which this location would be hit by a fierce storm. Deshret and her Akara used the cover of the dust storm to their advantage as they killed Titusius's entire gemling legion. It is said that Deshret skinned Titusius and used his skin as her Roa saddle. Thus, High Templar Vol helped the Mariketh defeat their main foe and reclaim their homelands. And in return, Deshret and the Mariketh helped Vol succeed in his purity rebellion against Chittis and the Empire. After the Cataclysm, many people in Rayclast were killed, turned, or brought back to life. Deshret had seen many of these monstrosities, and she was aware that the source of the devastation came from within the mines under Highgate. She sealed the mines and commanded her Akara 
to remain to guard them. Bull himself ended up as an undead monster. After escorting Malachi and the rapture device to the mines of Mount Veruso, the undead Vol wandered to the dried lake, violent and crazed, and killed Deshret himself. Deshret carried a banner with her, which was the key to opening the sealed-off mines. Because of Vol's terrible power, the rest of her Akara have stayed away from the dried lake. It's sad to think that the leader of the Purity Rebellion was turned into a thaumaturgical nightmare himself, and killed an ally he'd worked with so closely. To open the mines, we must go to the Dried Lake and kill the undead High Templar Vol. He drops Deshret's banner, which will allow us to open the mines. In Act 1, we learn that after the Cataclysm, Kaum began having visions he believed were from Tukohama to lead his people to an offering that will save the Karui. He led 500 of his greatest warriors north into Rayclast, and the final destination of this group was in the mines below Mount Veruso. Deshret witnessed Kaum and his Karui disappear into the mines, some years before she sealed them. Tasuni is able to hear the beast, and we know from Diala that Malachi's destination with the rapture device was inside the mines. But Tasuni claims that he also hears the spirit of Deshret herself deep within the mines. We open the seal with Deshret's banner and begin our descent into Mount Veruso. The mines are littered with terrifying creatures, monsters of melded flesh, likely mutated from the thaumaturgical waste and tears of Maji, aka virtue gems, buried within. There are three levels of the mines. Upon entering the mines, the entire system shakes, seemingly in anticipation of our arrival. On the second level, we are able to find the spirit of Deshret, even though Deshret did not physically die in the mines. Somehow, her spirit had been trapped down in the mines since her death. We free her from the grasp of a ghostly hand and continue into the mines. The third level is called the Crystal Mines, and we can see this is where many of the Virtue Gems were likely stored, or perhaps just what's left after Emperor Chittis sent his Karui, Mariketh, and Ezemite slaves to mine for gems in here. At the end of these Crystal Mines, we find Diala waiting for us, standing next to the rapture device and two portals. The two portals next to Diala are called Kaum's Dream and Dereso's Dream, and Diala tells us that Malachi lured both the spirits of Kaum and Dereso here for his own purposes. The voice that called to Kaum under the guise of Tukahama was actually Malachi using the beast's power of nightmare. Kaum and Dereso's spirits are now both trapped here, each eternally reliving the peak of emotions. For Kaum, it is fury, and for Dereso, it is desire. Kaum's dream takes us to our first map-like instance. It is a recreation of the path which Kaum took his 500 best warriors on in search of Tukahama's offering for the Karui. Tukahama is the warrior god of the Karui. Legend has it that the Karui were peaceful farmers before Tukahama put stone axes in their hands, and the hunger for conquest in their bellies. Kaum calls himself a son of Tukohama, and has extreme reverence for the traditions and gods of his Karui ancestry. As we travel farther on the path Kaum took, we read on carvings that Kaum believed his warriors were crushing the servants of Kitava, the Karui god of hunger, and took pride that he let not one of his 500 fall as they traveled. But when Kaum reached what he believed was Tukahama, it asked him to kill his 500 warriors as a sacrifice, and Kaum did so willingly. We crushed the servants of Kitaba beneath our heels as we marched across the land. I allowed not one of my 500 to fall. We descended into the heart of Rayclast, and there he came to me. Tukahama. He asked of me a sacrifice. I gave it willingly. My axe fell five hundred times, the jade drinking its fill of Karui blood. Tukahama was pleased. This pinnacle of Kaum's fury is what Kaum's dream represents. When we reach Kaum and kill him, we receive the Eye of Fury and bring it back to Diala. The second portal takes us to Dereso's dream, which is a reincarnation of the Grand Arena of Sarn where Dereso fought when he was alive. Unlike Kaum, it is unclear whether Dereso physically entered the mines, 
But as we've seen with Deshret, one does not have to physically die in the mines to have their spirit trapped here by nightmare. Doresso's dream shows us his desires from a young age to become the greatest gladiator in the Empire, but it also chronicles the story of how he met Mervale. We killed Mervale in Act 1, a woman transformed into a monstrous and crazed siren by a necklace called the Star of Rayclast. This necklace was a gift from Doresso, and he left Mervale in the middle of the night to find a cure for her transformation. We know Doresso never successfully found a cure, but now it seems Doresso's spirit was captured by Nightmare and forced to relive this desire for glory and his wife forever. When we slay Doresso, we receive the Eye of Desire and bring it back to Diala. After we brought Diala both the Eye of Fury and of Desire, she tells us we shall be able to activate Malachi's Rapture Device. When Malachi first used the Rapture Device to find the beast, he asked Diala to sacrifice herself to power the device. Whether or not this was actually necessary is not yet clear. Either way, Diala now willingly gives herself to the Rapture Device to blow open an entrance into the core of the beast. When the device activates, the gems embedded in Diala across her head and body are ripped from her to power the machine. Before us stands a shriveled husk of a woman, looking how we might expect a 300-year-old woman to appear. Diala ushers us onward into what is called the Belly of the Beast. This Belly of the Beast is a path of literal entrails. Where the beast begins and ends, it is hard to say, but it seems we have literally entered the insides of this beast the nightmare that Malachi resides in, and piety sought. As we travel through the intestines, we end up finding an old friend reborn under the influence of nightmare. Piety, who we killed in Act 3, has been found and resurrected as a nightmare version of herself and stands before us in the belly of the beast. After seeking the works of Malachi and his students for so long, now Malachi and the beast have sought out the spirit of piety, Piety has become similar to one of the experiments she performed on so many exiles of Oriath. She has been horribly mutated, but when we fight and kill her, she returns to her previous and familiar form. Piety tells us that Malachi's students, Chevron, Malagaro, and a witch named Doedre, were the ones to transform her. Piety, after being the victim of the type of experiments she herself performed, is now wanting to take down Malachi. While she reveres the power of the beast, she sees now that Malachi's vision is warped. She tells us that she does not regret what she sought to do, only how she did it. And she says, prior to meeting Malagaro, Chevron, and Doedre, I rather admired them. Their work, their accomplishments, sheer genius. As it turns out, genius is something better appreciated from afar. Deshret's spirit was also a puppet of Malachi's students, tortured continuously by them, but never succumbing to their torture, hence remaining as a spirit rather than a monstrous recreation. We follow Piety into the harvest, getting close to the core of the beast. There are writings left by Malachi, and through them we find out Malachi had never wanted or needed Diala to sacrifice herself for the rapture device to work. Malachi planned to enter the beast and control it on his own, and he wanted Diala to leave and escape the cataclysm he knew would happen. So he lied to Vol and Diala about his true intentions with the rapture device. All of Malachi's work was leading to his entering and controlling the beast, the nightmare, the source of thaumaturgy in the world. Piety waits for us by the entrance to the Black Core, where Malachi resides. Apparently, Malachi has resurrected his three students to guard three of his organs. These organs are what keep Malachi tied to mortality, rather than being completely absorbed by the beast. Even though Vol killed and burned Malagaro and Doedre after the Purity Rebellion, and Chevron was killed by Brutus, Malachi was able to resurrect them for his purposes. We have already seen the works of Malagaro and Chevron, but there is the third student we haven't yet encountered named Doedre. Doedre Darktongue was a spellcaster and student of the Inquisitor Malagaro. Malagaro himself removed Doedre's tongue, giving her the nickname Dark Tongue. Doedre may be the most sick and depraved of Malachi's students. She was interested in taking people apart to find the wonders of the universe, and used her own body for thaumaturgical experiments. 
Doedre was a fan of curses and transmogrification, as we can see from our battle with her for Malachi's lungs, in which she appears as a horrifying, bloated apparition. We kill Chevron and Malagaro for the remaining organs, bring them to Piety to open up the Black Core, and face Malachi. Malachi is the inspiration for Piety's pursuits, and the dire state of Rayclast is due to the cataclysm Malachi caused. During Emperor Chittis Parandus' reign, Malachi was an ambitious thaumaturgist. He studied the works of the ancient Val alongside Isseus Parandus, whose writings we recovered for Siosa in the Sarn Library. In these writings, Isseus translated texts from Doriani of the Val, who spoke of the beast Malachi now resides within. Malachi was smart and manipulative, and his rediscovery of ancient knowledge and technology previously buried and forgotten swayed Chittis Parandus to the powers of thaumaturgy. It was Malachi who began the trend of implanting virtue gems into people which spawned the Gemling Legion. Malachi convinced Emperor Chittis that not only would virtue gems make his army and citizens the most powerful and most eternal, but that his creations would be ultra-loyal to Chittis, that the heart of each soldier beats in time with the heart of his emperor. If the emperor wishes that beat to stop, it stops. And this was true, for Malachi had implanted above Chittis' heart a virtue gem that would connect him to all of his gemling legion. This is why the majority of gemlings turned into the Undying when Emperor Chittis was slain in 1334 during the Purity Rebellion. According to Malachi's own journals, the first time Malachi came in physical contact with a virtue gem, he began to have dreams where he spoke with the beast. He called these dreams lessons cloaked in nightmare, and says these dreams are the source of all his ideas for thaumaturgical experiments. The beast has been given many names throughout history, including beast, nightmare, and darkness. According to Tasuni, Malachi is the one who knew the beast's true name and understood its impenetrable nature. Malachi's ultimate pursuit was to control a beast because it is the source of all thaumaturgy. In Act 3, Grigor tells us, When piety was experimenting on me, I met a presence. Intelligence, power, immensity beyond the limits of my pitiable mortal senses. I heard piety speak to her lackeys of the beast. It is the source of her thaumaturgy and the object of her ambitions. I believe piety's beast and that dark entity are one and the same. It would not be a stretch of reason to consider the beast the source of all malformation in Rayclast. A secondary pursuit was to create the perfect gemling, which is where Diala comes in. Since Malachi was the only one to understand the beast and know it was the source of thaumaturgy, he was able to convince Vol and trick Diala into believing that Malachi could and would kill the beast to end thaumaturgy. Malachi wants to remake the world in the image of Nightmare. Malachi, with the beast's power, is able to influence the outside world and has since the Cataclysm. We enter the black core of the beast with Piety, who transforms multiple times between her original self and Malachi's nightmare version of her, under his control. Eventually she is killed, and we follow Malachi into the heart of the beast itself. Once we slay Malachi, it seems we have slain the beast as well, such is their connection at this point. Perhaps Malachi sought immortality, but his decision to keep his organs, a sentimental mistake, allows us to kill him and the beast that has so long influenced the world with its power of nightmare. We return to Highgate, where we are congratulated by most on our bravery for killing the beast that caused the cataclysm. Everyone but Tasuni. While Tasuni tells us of a path to Oriath that is opened on the mountaintop, he seems less than enthused at the death of the beast. With this foreboding in mind, we make our way to a portal to Oriath. Welcome back, Exile, to another video in Noodle's complete lore series. This video covers Act 5 and our return to Oriath. Let's get started. At the end of Act 4, we travel to the top of Mount Veruso and find a large device called the Resonator that activates a portal to Oriath. This device was left by Dominus, and is how Piety and Dominus were able to travel between Rayclast and Oriath without raising suspicion. 
We enter the portal and end up in the slave pens of Theopolis, capital city of Oriath. As we heard from Maramoa in Sarn and the Marraketh of Highgate, Oriath has continued the Empire's tradition of enslaving the Karui, Marraketh, and Ezemites. Oriath slave enforcers attack us as we make our way through the pens, but we also see slaves who are friendly and also fighting these enemies. All across the ground you can see corpses and grates where hands desperately reach out to escape. A slave rebellion has begun. We fight our way through the pens until we come across Overseer Crow. When we kill him, a ladder is lowered from above, allowing us to escape the rebellion in the pens to the Overseer's Tower. The Overseer's Tower was once run by the Oriath who controlled and sold the slaves below, but it is now the refuge of a strange mixed group of survivors of the rebellion. Hiding in the tower are Utula, Lani, and Valenta. Utula is a Karui who has been a slave in Oriath. He started the slave rebellion we just fought through, in the name of the Karui god Kitaba, who Utula calls the Tormented One. Utula says Kitaba, the immortal slave, understands our plight like no other, in regards to the slaves he has rallied into rebellion. Lani is a half Karui, half Oriath woman. She was raised as an Oriath and not a Karui slave, but in this rebellion she sided with the Karui slaves and fought two overseers herself which left her mortally wounded. Lani credits Valenta with saving her life. Valenta is an Oriath woman who specializes in medicine. She was actually experimenting on the Karui slaves before the rebellion. But when she saved Lani's life, Lani insisted that Valenta be allowed to live. Valenta and Piety worked for Dominus together. And Valenta says, Piety and I have devoted ourselves to the betterment of the human condition. As for our methods, Piety had a saying that summed it up nicely. Would you consider the feelings of the stones when constructing a glorious cathedral in the name of God? When Piety left for Rayclast, Valenta was furious, as Valenta felt she had devoted her life and her work to Piety's vision. She created a tool called the Miasmeter, which she used to keep an eye on Rayclast, particularly Piety. Valenta tells us, that through this instrument she heard the beast scream as it died, and she knows it was our doing. Valenta had to leave the miasmeter behind during the slave rebellion, and she wants us to retrieve it. Lani wants us to find and kill Justicar Casticus, the man who supplied Karui slaves to Valenta for her experiments. We leave the tower to the control blocks, which is where Valenta used to experiment on slaves. We travel through this maze of a slave pen and find Valenta's miasmeter and also run into Justicar Casticus, who Valenta used to work alongside. Justicar Casticus is a member of the Templars, which High Templar Dominus used to lead. We kill Justicar Casticus and make our way out of the control blocks into the large open area of the Oriath Square, Center Theopolis. This square connects to every major area of Theopolis. These areas include the Templar Courts, the Cathedral, the Ossuary, and the Reliquary. The Templars have been their own power in Oriath since before the Purity Rebellion, but the founding of Oriath itself is unclear. A man named Templar Devaro, a contemporary under High Templar Dominus, studied artifacts brought from Rayclass to Oriath about the Val. Through his research, there is evidence that the Val were on Oriath as well. Before now, Oriath was untouched by the cataclysm that plagued Rayclast, but there has clearly been unrest. The death of High Templar Dominus seems to be a partial catalyst for this change, but something else seems to be motivating this rebellion. The Templar Courts and the Chamber of Innocence are the center stronghold for the Templars. The Templars are a religious order, and as we make our way through the courts to the inner chambers, we learn about their god, Innocence. Innocence is an ancient god, and in the Chamber of Innocence we read his origins on the ornate stained glass. Innocence and Sin are brother gods from the Mother of Two. The story says that Innocence listened to their mother and was rewarded for his virtuous nature. Sin stole and lied, and so Innocence told the mother that Sin was beyond rule and redemption, and Sin was burned to ash. Mankind breathed in the ash of sin, and sin took root in the bodies of men and women and children. Innocence swore to burn all traces of sin in the world. 
No matter where the ashes of sin fell, his purifying flames would rise to meet them. The Templar Order started when Innocents created a weapon called the Staff of Purity and bestowed it to the first High Templar, named Maximus. This weapon was part of Innocents himself and thus imbued with his essence. The Templars have worshipped Innocents and the idea of purifying mankind of sin ever since their inception. Both High Templar Vol and High Templar Dominus held the same seat yet they had very different standards of purity. Vol, as we saw in his Purity Rebellion, believed all thaumaturgy was evil and planned to destroy the root of it. Dominus saw thaumaturgy as a way to become more powerful, to give himself and his followers the touch of God. At the end of the Chamber of Innocence, we meet the newly appointed High Templar, Avarius. Utula tells us, with Dominus away in Rayclast, someone had to keep the wheels of oppression turning. Avarius was only too happy to take the job. It was Avarius who led some of the largest and most crippling raids upon the Namakanui. It was on his orders that men, women, and children were shackled and shipped like cattle to Theopolis. And it was Avarius who spent 5,000 Karui lives building his Templar courts and his Chamber of Innocence, who had wives and daughters scrub their husbands' and fathers' blood from the stones so as to preserve their purity. We fight High Templar Avarius, who seems fanatic. When he falls, something similar to Dominus's transformation happens. Only this time Avarius does not turn into a vision of nightmare, he becomes a god, innocence. While Utula and Valenta have hinted at this as we progress through Oriath, it is now clear. Somehow, gods of old roam free. This is the true cause of panic and uprising in Oriath. When Utula says that he is a follower of Kitava, he does not simply refer to the lessons of this old god. He has communion with the real Kitava. And, naturally, Innocence, when reborn, goes to the Templars that worship him. Innocence chose High Templar Avarius and took over his body. Fighting Innocence is significantly more challenging than fighting Avarius, but upon his defeat, the aforementioned brother of Innocence, the god Sin, appears. We can now assume all gods in the lore of Rayclast and Oriath might be real. Unlike the Templar's writings about Sin, it seems that Sin is actually concerned for the well-being of mankind. Sin informs us that killing the beast has awoken all the old gods. How does Sin know this? Because Sin is the creator of the beast. Sin created the beast specifically to keep the gods at bay in a deep slumber, the Nightmare. This nightmare was powerful enough to keep all the gods asleep, but it also drew the attention of many power-seeking mortals throughout Rayclast's history. And here we thought we were saving the world by killing the beast. Or maybe Valenta was right, and we had no benevolent intentions in slaying the beast. Perhaps we are just killers and opportunists ourselves. Sin wants to see the gods of old subdued once more, and since we were able to slay Malachi and the beast, Sin tasks us with this, with promises of more power. After we defeat Innocence and meet Sin, we emerge from the Chamber of Innocence to find a man named Bannon, demanding we explain ourselves. Bannon was a former Blackguard, as the Ebony Legion we have seen on Rayclast originates in Oriath under the High Templars. When we re-enter the Templar courts, everything is now on fire. The destruction of Innocence has allowed the other god present in Oriath to take over. He has marked himself all over the Templar courts with a red X, and his cultists run amok. This is Kitava, the Karui god that Utula had mentioned earlier and that Kaum himself feared. When we return to the Overseer's Tower, Bannon is waiting for us, but Utula is missing. Lani informs us that Utula left as soon as Innocence was vanquished, claiming he was called by Kitava. Valenta tells us Innocence's Staff of Purity is a real weapon we can find in the ossuary, and that we should use it to defeat Kitava. Lani knows of ancient Karui artifacts in the Reliquary, a place where holy relics are kept, and she believes we may learn more about Kitava there. The Oriath Square is in ruins as well, covered in the blood and fervor of Kitava's cultists. We must traverse this ruined square to find the information and tools suggested to defeat Kitava. When we enter the square, we can hear Utula shouting to the followers of Kitava, 
yelling what seems like a sermon. Fun fact, Utula has his sermon of Kitava written down by Erwin of Theopolis into the Holy Book of Hunger, clearly in the style of religious texts even calling himself High Priest Utula. Utula has been transformed by Kitava into Itula Stone and Steel. We defeat this monstrous vision of Utula and continue on to the reliquary. The reliquary is a place where ancient and holy relics are kept, and here we can find three relics of the Karui gods. As we gather the Karui artifacts for Lani, we find writings about Kitava himself. The three entries chronicle the story of Kitava and Tukahama. To summarize, Aruhungai, daughter of the moon, wanted to have a feast for Tukahama returning from war with the first ones of the Ezemites. Tawa, son of the forest, gathered birds to be cooked for the feast. Kitava, the god of hunger, told Aruhungai he would watch the birds as they cooked, but instead he ate all of them. When Tukahama arrived, Aruhungai told what happened and asked for Kitava to be punished. Tukahama pulled out his tooth, one of the artifacts we find, and cut Kitava across the face in two diagonal strokes, blinding him and marking him with a large X, which we've seen symbolized in the Templar courts and spoilers we will see face to face later. To replace the birds Kitava ate, Tukahama and Velako, father of the storm, go fishing with Kitava. In the boat, Kitava eats all the bait for the fish. Velako takes off his own jaw, the second Karui artifact, and hooks Kitava, intending to use him as bait for the fish instead. At the bottom of the sea, Kitava eats all of the fish. When Tukahama and Velako pull him up, they decide Kitava needs ultimate punishment. They take Kitava to Hinakora, the mother of death. They ask Hinakora to kill Kitava so that he does not starve the rest of the Karui. Hinakora decides death is not the correct punishment as a lesson needs to be learned. Hinakora beats Kitava with a whip made of her own hair, the third Karui artifact. She drives him to the underworld with her hair whip and leaves him to suffer without food or water for eternity. And that is where Kitava had remained, starving and tormented. That is, until we killed the beast and set the gods free. While this may seem like a fable intended to teach mortals a lesson, we can assume at least some of the tale is literal. The artifacts are real, and as we've seen, so is Kitava. The ossuary is a place where the bones of dead Oriath are placed. As we make our way through the maze of bones, we find the Staff of Purity. With knowledge of Kitava and the Staff of Purity, we make off for the cathedral to face Kitava. Kitava is on the roof of the Theopolis Cathedral. Kitava is a primal god like sin or innocence, unlike the mortals who became gods. He is the god of hunger. His punishment by the other Karui gods has inflamed his desire to consume. When Malachi spoke to Kaum through Nightmare, he told Kaum that the world was infested with Kitava's followers and that Tukahama would give Kaum an offering to free his Karui from oppression. Haku, a Karui, believes that Kaum's vision to lead his Karui to Mount Verusa was actually Kitava's corruption, bringing him to madness and turning Kaum into one of Kitava's slaves, like Utula. While Kaum's vision may have actually been a dream from Nightmare with a Karui interpretation, rather than Kitava's direct influence, it seems Kitava can truly corrupt and consume everything around him. Kitava's massive size and power seem an imminent threat to Oriath. Just like the beast before, we will attempt to defeat something that has been undefeated for centuries. We take Innocence's Staff of Purity and plant it like a banner to aid us in this fight. Kitava is insanely powerful, and halfway through the battle, the Staff of Purity is broken, and so are we. We fall to the ground, and Sin flies down to gather us before we are consumed by Kitava. Sin carries us to the Oriath docks, where a woman named Lily Roth offers to sail us back to Rayclast. Oh, you make me want to talk back Talk back to you Say you say it like that If I hate 
Choke.